These are everywhere along our roadways. Seldom seen though, as is proven by upgrading drivers who've had their license for some time and then get into a commercial vehicle and you ask them what the last road sign was that they saw and they really can't tell you. So today we're gonna to tell you about traffic signs, the very information you need to drive safer and smarter. Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. So we have quite a number of people here tonight. Good evening, Tim, my friend Tim from Drive Smart BC. If you wanna know anything about legislation, anything about traffic and policing here in the province of British Columbia, check out Tim's website over at Drive Smart BC as well. There is an awesome forum over there, so check that out. My friend Rocky is here, Con is here from Toronto. Uh, Goose is here from Sydney, 9 p.m. Uh, and I hope that everybody is staying cool. It is 43 degrees Fahrenheit here in Vernon, which is 115 degrees, uh, no, it's 43 degrees Celsius, <laughs> which is 118 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's fairly toasty here. And uh, so I have to say that uh, I'm kind of happy that I have central air in my house at this current time. <laughs> and Tim, you are most welcome. This coming Friday is my 27th birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, early birthday to you Sheldon and Corey is here Corey is bricks for wheels Corey is excellent excellent at getting up videos that I suggest that you have a look at for a more in-depth look at a topic on a question you ask me uh, Younes is here from Morocco welcome from Morocco and my friend John is here from the Philippines so we got people from everywhere in the world that is awesome and hello Mallory my friend Mallory is here Mallory is an excellent excellent smart driver uh, and asks really awesome questions LW, Carlita, hello, hello, and as well, t-shirts being uh, featured there at the top of the stream, so have a look at that. Uh, and Coop Dog is taking his test on the 6th of July, and just that I'm talking about the 6th of July, next week, the uh, live stream will be on Monday, because Sunday is the 4th of July, and the 1st of July, we're not really sure here in Canada whether we're going to have Canada Day or not, we're thinking it's... Uh, it's been canceled indefinitely until further notice for whatever reason. Uh, so we might have Canada Day on the 1st of July, but I know for sure that the Americans are going to have their whatever, uh, you know, Independence Day <laughs> on the 4th of July, because I know there isn't, a, isn't any chance that they're going to cancel Independence Day in the States. So next week, the live stream will be on Monday, and I'm thinking, and maybe you could have some suggestions for me, about another time during the week that we could have the live stream that would work for everybody because I'm thinking I'm going to move it during the week because Sunday in the summertime, ah, eh, you know, I got the beach. <laughs> when it's 118 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm thinking the beach. Uh, Flexi, you can definitely ask for sure. Uh, Byron, hello, my friend, fully licensed driver. That's awesome. And Nicholas from the Congo in Africa. Awesome. We have people from all over the world. And Margaret's going to be out of town on the 4th of July. So this is why we're moving the live stream next week to the Monday because people are going to be out of town for their celebrations. That is incredible. Uh, last day of homeschooling tomorrow for Rocky. That's terrific. Awesome. Uh, yeah, 36 degrees on the island. <laughs> Tim, yeah, it's 43 here in Vernon. Uh, and unfortunately, with this heat, the province is going to be on fire in a couple of weeks. And... Actually, I think most of the West Coast is probably going to be on fire. So, you know, I went out and stocked up some marshmallows today. That's really bad humor. Really bad humor. So let's talk about driving. Let's talk about traffic signs. Uh, my left hand has a problem. Can I drive a car? Flexi, you can definitely drive a car if you have a problem with your left hand. You can get a spinner and there are other uh, 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 modifications you can make to the vehicle that will allow you to drive the vehicle with a disability. So uh, look at the video. There's a couple of videos here on the channel about driving with disabilities. And Corey will put the one up for you. I did uh, a few months ago with Nelson Shadenuf in Calgary with South Trail Driving School. And he is a fully mod modified vehicle. And we go over that uh, and show you all of the modifications that will help you to drive if you're learning to drive with a disability. Uh, Margaret, 84 degrees Fahrenheit right now here and was over 90 today. And I'm sure in the city with 90 degrees, it's gonna feel a lot warmer than that. Louise, uh, Kissimmee, Florida, hello. Kissimmee, 
You gotta say that right. You can't say Kissimmee. It's Kissi Kissimmee. <laughs> I still didn't say it right. That's funny. Oh my God. Jim, how are you, my friend? Atlanta, August, Georgia. Uh, God bless you as well. I'm gonna pass my driver's test. I believe in myself. That's awesome, Coop Dog. And uh, Tim, my biggest fear here is not an earthquake, it's a forest fire. Yeah, Tim, I agree with you that I'm much more afraid of fire forest fires than I am of earthquakes. And for since we're talking about forest fires, let's just talk a little bit about safety in terms of forest fires for those of us that do live on the west coast of North America. And they are inevitably coming because this kind of heat, it's, it's going to happen that we're going to have forest fires. One thing that a lot of people don't know about forest fires, forest fires create their own winds. They generate winds up to 100 miles an hour. If the fire is raging, there's huge, enormous winds. So don't think that if, you know, the roads are closed for whatever reason, because, you know, uh, emergency crews have closed the roads for purposes of safety, that you can drive through there because you can't because there's winds and the winds drive smoke and for those of you who haven't experienced forest fires in north america on the west coast here uh we see smoke as far as from hundreds and hundreds of miles away if there's forest fires in california in british columbia we get smoke from those fires so know that your vision is going to be incredibly limited if you are driving in an area where there are forest fires. So know that as a driver, as a professional driver, okay? Younes, I'm a truck driver here in Morocco. It's a dream for me to get work. Uh, any chance as a truck driver in Canada? There is, Younes. Uh, you have to get the, the challenging part, especially right now with COVID in the world, is you have to get a work permit to be able to come to Canada and work as a truck driver here. Uh, Fatima, I watched your YouTube videos and I passed my driver's test. Great job. Keep it up. And that is absolutely awesome that you passed your driver's test. Thank you for dropping back and letting us know. That is incredible. Uh, Yunz, you're most welcome. So happy we can help out. Kara, I have a driver's test and I'm nervous. What can I do to keep myself to calm down? Uh, Kara, remember to breathe. Okay. Visualize the wind and as well with the breathing, that will force your body to calm down. It, it forces your body to relax. So in through the nose, out through the mouth. Okay, so do that and visualize the wind. Uh, Goose, it'll be down to 16 degrees by 6 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> Goose, I think it's going to go down to 25 degrees Celsius here tonight. So that's the other issue that we're having is that it's not cooling down overnight. It's, it's incredibly hot here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Con, thank you for your tips. I am particularly boxing your turns. I just passed my B road test. And yes, thank you for reminding me that, Con. I thought it was you that was doing your B last week. We were talking about that and you had some questions. Congratulations on passing your school bus license there in the province of Ontario. That is absolutely awesome. And I'm so happy that we could help out, especially with boxing your turns. And as well, Con, uh, I have a whole series of videos that I've been working on for a client uh, about intersection awareness and boxing your turns for CDL vehicles and those types of things. And I don't think that they want exclusive rights of those videos. So I believe I'm going to talk to them this week that I'm going to be able to put those videos up in August. So in August, there'll be a series of defensive driving videos for CDL drivers on the YouTube channel that would be available to you as well. And I'm hoping that you've got work lined up for the fall because school is going to go back in in the fall and we're all going to get going and back to some semblance of re reality. I was actually thinking it was so much reality today that I walked into a shop today without my mask on. So I had to go back out and get that. Uh, Jim, what's up? Uh, Atlanta checking in. Okay. Yep. Uh, I think that Georgia is heading back, and this is the other thing for a lot of you who are in the states right now who uh, have clo closed circuit testing. So Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia, those are just a few of the states that I can think of off the top of my head who had closed circuit testing there in the U.S. Be sure that you check what your DMV is doing because a lot of these states are now going back to on-road testing. So before you show up for your driver's test, figure out what they're doing. All right, so before we get too much more into this, <laughs> Kara, uh, you're my favorite YouTuber. Kara, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you for being part of the Smart Driver community here. And uh, 
Uh, Jim Bob, I heard that an apartment, yes, an apartment did collapse in Miami, Miami and that's really unfortunate, very terrible news. Uh, May, hello from Victoria, 37 degrees here in Victoria, class seven road test tomorrow morning. Should I follow the school zone speed limits? Uh, last uh, day of school was Thursday. No, May, uh, you're, it's gonna be 50 kilometers an hour. It's not gonna be uh, the school speed zones because school's not, school's in summer vacation now, okay? Excellent, so let's get over to the slideshow presentation here. So today we're talking about road signs and sarcastically said that unfortunately, people don't pay attention to, dry, to road signs as much as they should. And if you want to become a safer, smarter driver and drive more defensively, take more note of what the traffic signs are along the roadway. Try to glean the information off the signs. This will make you a better driver overall. All right, so those of you who are new to Smart Drive Test or just tuning in or watching on the replay, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver through the 1990s. 1997, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor in the province of Ontario. Uh, 2002, I moved to Australia, went to university there. Uh, in preparation to go to university, I regained my license in the state of Victoria, Australia to become a licensed driving instructor there. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with my doctorate in legal history, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. So, you know, more, much more about what we're talking about. Uh, while I was going to university, I drove buses for Greyhound and for one of the regional bus lines there. So I have bus experience as well. And in 2015, I started the YouTube channel and the online smart drive test business, which has been wildly more successful than I could have ever imagined because here in the next month or so, we are going to turn over 200,000 subscribers and 30 million views, which just boggles my mind. That's just absolutely incredible. So if you want to know more about me, about the uh, Smart Drive Test story, head over to the Smart Drive Test website, the autobiography. Uh, click on the link, uh, contact us. You'll find it under there as well. There's the Smart Drive Test story, so have a look at that as well. So new video this week with Kayla, driving lesson with Kayla. I do apologize about the audio on that video. It wasn't very good. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I was working, trying to find a video editor and they didn't come through for me. So, uh, you know, <laughs> onwards and upwards. And so we are looking for a video editor at Smart Drive Test. So if you know anybody who knows how to use Final Cut Pro and is good with that and can do multicam editing, that would be great. Check out that video. We were working on two-way stops with uh, Kayla and getting her ready for a driver's test. Uh, for those of you who are following it, you. I said in the video that uh, we started on Monday, she had a driver's test on Friday. Unfortunately, she had to postpone her driver's test because she had some mechanical problem with her vehicle. So have a look at that. So traffic signs convey information in three ways. Uh, the shape of the sign, the color, and the words or symbols thereon. All right, so regulatory signs as a rule are rectangular in shape and white background with black lettering or symbols. These are construction signs and construction signs are orange background, usually diamond in shape and <clears throat> black lettering and symbols on them. Road sign classifications, regulatory signs, school signs, and school signs are kind of all over the place in terms of uh, you know, the a classification of signs. They're not consistent like other signs are. Uh, you know, cautionary signs, stop signs, railway signs all tend to be consistent. School signs tend to be the least consistent of the traffic sign categories. Uh, cautionary signs, which, you know, give you a warning, give you a suggestion of what you should do on the roadway. And object marker signs, which are probably the most prolific signs along the roadway. Once I point out object marker signs, you'll see these things absolutely everywhere along the roadways. So object mar uh, marker signs, as I was just talking about, and there's a video here on the channel. Corey, I'll put that up for you. So they're the, they populate just about everywhere, and they mark fixed objects along the roadway. So the ends of bridge abutments, uh, bridge abutments. So bridges at the end of the bridges. On concrete islands, when you're turning right, there's going to be one there that's going to tell you to go left and right. And these are important if you start towing a trailer, you start driving a pickup truck, a bigger vehicle, you're going to have to pay attention to these things because you don't want to be driving into fixed objects when you're driving your vehicle. All right, so object marker signs. Have a 
look at these, figure out where they are, and when you're thinking of an object marker sign, you can see the hash marks on there. Think of pouring a kettle of water on it, and when the side that the water pours off is the side that you need to pass on for your uh, uh, for safety. Regulatory signs, and the uh, the root word of regulatory is regulation, which means it's the law, and you must obey these signs. And this is one of the reasons that you will fail a driver's test is because you did an action contrary to a regulatory sign. So stop signs, you didn't come to a complete stop. Speed signs are regulatory signs. Railway crossing signs, if there's a train and you don't slow down or you don't stop at the proper distance from the railway crossing, that is going to be a failing on your driver's test. And then for commercial vehicles, bus drivers, CDL vehicles, if you go through a brake check, these two are regulatory signs and you must stop at the brake check and do a pre-trip inspection and make sure that your brakes are working before you proceed down the hill. Intersection signs, and these are everywhere. <laughs> and we know as traffic professionals that more than 40% of crashes happen at intersections. So these are also signs that you should be taking note of as you're driving along the roadways. Conventional intersections, T intersections, roundabouts, Y intersections, and offset intersections are just some of the cautionary signs that you will find along the roadways. Uh, this one down here in the bottom <clears throat> is telling you that there's a lane that you don't have to merge into the other tr uh, lane of traffic as you go around the corner here. So you can just go around the corner. This one tells you that the road ends. It's the T intersection. And this one tells you that you're going to intersect with a railway. So know that these intersection signs can potentially save your life because if you take note that there's an intersection, you scan the intersection, map the road users, and then track them, you're going to be a safer, smarter driver. Cautionary signs. These are warning signs. Not rec they're not telling you that you must do something, and you'll see these everywhere, especially with these curve signs at 45 miles per hour, which is, which is a suggested speed for the curve. If you're new and into the area and you haven't been there before, then yes, do 45 miles an hour. But once you get accustomed to the area and you know how fast you can go around that curve, then you don't necessarily have to do 45 miles an hour. Okay, so some are relevant and some are not. So height signs, if you're driving a larger vehicle and your vehicle is the regulation or the maximum regulation that you're allowed is 13 feet, six inches in the United States or 4.15 meters here in Canada, and you drive under a bridge that's 11 feet, eight inches, guess what? You're gonna now be driving a convertible. <laughs> so even though this is a cautionary sign, <coughs> excuse me, even though this is a cautionary sign, this is a sign that is absolutely, you must pay attention to when you're driving a larger commercial vehicle. So you get, and that's the other part that's difficult when you're learning how to drive is you need to figure out which one of these are relevant and which one of these aren't. Larger vehicles, destination signs, overhead signs, match the speed of the flow of traffic. So pay attention to road signs when you're driving larger vehicles or you're moving to larger vehicles, especially if you're gonna be moving to driving a pickup truck with a horse trailer or those types of things. You now, it becomes imperative that you pay attention to the, the road signs to keep yourself safe. And especially overhead signs because like I said, you don't want to turn your vehicle into a convertible. Lane usage signs, and these are going to tell you the lane that you're in, which whether you can go straight through or whether you have to turn left or whether you have to turn right. And I can tell you from personal experience that when I was a new driver, I didn't pay attention to drive to road signs as much as I should have in the first few months of driving a tractor trailer unit. And I've got hung up in an intersection. <coughs> Excuse me, because I didn't pay attention to the overhead lane usage signs. And these are over top of the lane and they're regulatory signs and they're a white background, rectangular in shape with black arrows on them. And they can tell you that you can go left only, left only, and then the other lane is left and straight through. So they tell you what you can do and what direction you can go through the intersection in that lane. Mile marker signs. These are incredibly important when you're driving along highways and freeways. And I know that a lot of us in this day and age will simply stick our phone in the holder in the car and watch the map on the phone. 
you're not going to be paying attention to mile marker signs and those types of things. But if you learn one thing, especially if you're driving on interstates and freeways fit and, and state roads in the U.S., figure out what the mile markers mean and how to use them as a tool for your driving because it will keep you safe and it will allow you to not just like all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, there's my exit. And you just like just cut everybody off to get to your exit because you don't want to miss your exit. When you're driving along, for example, and you know that you're going to get off at exit 376 and you're at 370, you know that you have six miles up the road, you're going to get off at your exit. So start moving over to the right in preparation to get off the road because you know that in six miles you're going to get off the road at exit 376. And so it can be down along on another sign here on the side of the road, as you can see here, or for destination signs along the interstate over here. All of these numbers that are along the top here are going to be the mile marker signs. The exit number and the mile marker sign are going to be the same, except for the state of New York. The state of New York likes to be a little bit different in terms of their mile markers and a few other things. Their exit numbers don't line up with their mile markers. However, if you have it plugged into your phone, your phone will say to you, okay, in two miles, you're going to take the exit off to the right and those types of things. So this, these will really help you out in terms of <clears throat> excuse me, some of the signs along the interstates and freeways. So good luck in your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Ah, oh, sorry about that. Transition. There we are. And we're back. Uh, John, how do you know if it is a one or two lane when we go ahead? Uh, John, I'm not sure what you're asking me. So when you say one or two lanes, are you saying that it goes from one lane into two lane? Is that what you're asking me, John? Sarah, I am awesome. How are you doing, my friend? I got a frog living in my throat right now. I'm trying to get rid of and he didn't pick a good time to come. <laughs> uh, Tim, we have signs that are black on pink for temporary road conditions now too. Collision ahead. Oh, I haven't seen those, Tim. I'm going to have to find a picture of those and put something up on the website for that. Black on pink for temporary road conditions now too. Example collisions ahead. I can't say I've seen those yet, Tim. LW, I noticed that a lot of people go above the posted speed limit because they pass me. So how do I know whether to follow the speed limit or go with the flow? LW, do you have your driver's license already, or are you working for your to are you working to take a driver's test? Trudes Brown, hello my friend, how are you? Uh, Mallory, you're most welcome, my friend. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Sorrel, hello my friend. And Corey's put up those videos I suggested. Thank you for doing that, Corey. That's awesome. How to drive a car for beginners. Yes, definitely have a look at that if you're just getting started with your driving lessons uh, here on the channel. Coop Dog, uh, give me tips to pass my test. I want to be successful with my driver's test. And Coop Dog, we can talk a little bit about that for sure. Uh, space management, observation, communication, speed management. Those are the four things that you need to do for the purposes of your driver's test and to drive safely and be a smarter, safer driver. And essentially, so space management, make sure you're stopping in the correct place at controlled intersections. So before the stop line, before the sidewalk or crosswalk, and just before you enter the intersection if those two conditions don't exist. When you stop in traffic, stop back so that you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. Uh, don't drive into an intersection that you can't clear. Make sure that, you know, if the traffic's backed up, if it's congestion, morning rush hour, those types of things, stay back until you can drive through the intersection completely. Uh, for the purposes of a driver's test, yellow and red lights mean exactly the same thing. They both mean bring the vehicle to a stop if you can do so safely. Uh, green only means you can go only if the way is clear. Make sure that you bring the vehicle to a stop if there are emergency vehicles because that's an automatic fail on a driver's test. And actually, Corey will put the two videos up for you on most common mistakes on a driver's test and top 10 automatic fails on a driver's test. So that'll help you out. So space management and 
if you're not near anything, it's less likely you're going to hit anything for the purposes of your driver's test. Speed management for the purposes of your driver's test, you must drive the posted speed limit. So know that most of the traffic is going to be going faster than that than you or uh, the flow of traffic, whichever is less. So if the traffic's moving less than the posted speed limit, then do the flow of traffic. Observation, you have to observe correctly. So you need to have a scanning pattern in place when you're driving straight forward. So far down the road, in, look at your center mirrors. Far down the road, in, check your instrument panel. Far down the road, both shoulders, and then in and check your wing mirrors. So that's gonna be repeated every eight to 12 seconds. And your speed management is tied into your observation pattern. And so, uh, and then shoulder checking, two times for every turn, two times for every time you like change lanes. Uh, reversing, you're gonna do a 360 degree scan around the vehicle before uh, backing up, putting the vehicle in motion. And you're going to be looking out the back window uh, for the duration of reversing. You can use your mirrors, you can use a backup camera, but for the most part, you have to be looking out through the back window when you're backing up. And then communication. You have to communicate effectively your intentions on the, on the roadway, use of your signals, uh, eye contact. <coughs> what else? Lights and signals. Horn, use your horn sparingly. <coughs> hand gestures, use all five fingers. Don't, uh, don't tell somebody they're number one on a driver's test. And then finally, the position of your vehicle on the roadway communicates intention of what you're going to be doing. So that's kind of an overview of what you need to do for the purposes of passing a driver's test as well. You have to have all of those components in place to be a safer, smarter driver and drive defensively as well. And Corey's put up those two videos for you I suggested. Uh, have a look at those and they'll really help you out as well. Sorrel, I failed two times on my written test. Uh, Cyril, make sure that you have a look at the learners, uh, how to pass your learners permit uh, playlist. And Corey will put that playlist up for you as well. That'll help you out. Fernie, if everyone on the road is speeding, am I legally able to speed with them to keep the pace of traffic? Uh, Fernie, again, I asked the same question in terms of traffic flow. Do you have your driver's license? If you have your driver's license, then I advocate that you keep up with traffic flow because you're going to be safer because you're more predictable on the roadway. Driving the posted speed limit, you're going to be going slower than everybody else on the road. If you're working towards a driver's test, then you have to drive the posted speed limit in preparation for your test, okay? Goose, the mile marker was very interesting. I point these out to my students too. If they break down on the highway, they can tell dispatch the mile marker for the tow truck to find it easier. Absolutely. That's another uh, piece of the mile marker and being able to be found along the roadways and those types of things is being able to say, listen, I'm on Interstate 75 at mile marker 213. They're going to know exactly where you are and how to find you and get there. So yes, that's going to help them out as well. Uh, this, the story, <clears throat> uh, this is how it works for defensive driving, especially for people with larger vehicles. I had a student uh, some years ago, and we're in Kamloops, and in Kamloops there's a big hill. As you go up, as you go west on the Trans-Canada, you go up the hill. And so we're in a tandem tandem and he's behind Super Bs, which are two trailers, which weigh out at 140,000 pounds. And of course the Super B is going slower. And he says to me, he says, oh, can I, do I have enough time to pass the Super B? And of course we had done the route planning before we'd left. So the student kind of knew where we were going. And I said to him, I said, what exit are we getting off at? And he knew, he said, oh, we're getting off at uh, exit 268. And I said, what exit are we at? Which is something you should be paying attention to as you're driving along an interstate or freeway or highway. And he said, oh, we're at, we're at 263. And I said, so how far is it to exit 268? But the student didn't know at that point because nobody had taught him about mile markers that if you're at 263 and you're going to 268, it's five kilometers up the road. And I said, okay, so do you have enough room in five kilometers to pass that truck and then get over to your exit? He's, oh yeah, he did. So it's also defensive driving that, you know, when you need to get over to your 
exit, you know that you can pass the vehicle in front of you because you got five kilometers between you and where you are now and where you need to get off. So defensive driving, you know, you know, you know distances, you know exactly where you are along the roadway in terms of space and place and those types of things. So this is the other piece that I advocate uh, in terms of mile markers. Rocky, about the sign that says exit only, should drivers have to wait for other drivers to move out of the way when wanting to exit the highway? Also, never cut them off. <coughs> uh, not really sure what you're asking me, Rocky, in terms of exit only. If, if, you, if you need to get off and you're going to exit, obviously you've got to take that road. Uh, I don't know why other people would be there along a highway or freeway, so I'm not following what you're asking me. Uh, Jim Bob, grandfather stopped on a divided road all because of a fire truck was on the other side. Yeah, if there's a concrete median it, down the center, you don't have to stop for an emergency vehicle. And Corey will put the video up for you so you can have a look at that uh, and know when to stop for emergency vehicles. Uh, Sarah, will you get points off of a road test if you're going the wrong speed due to lack of speed limit signs? Uh, there's no posted speed limits. Okay, so Sarah... You need to go over to the Smart Drive Test website, go to the Frequently Asked Questions for your state or province, and figure out what the default speed limit, because every state, every province has a default speed limit. So, for example, in residential areas in the state of New York, it's 25 miles an hour. So, if you don't have a speed sign, and you don't know how fast to go along the roadway, just go to 25 miles an hour. If the examiner says, why are you doing 25, you either miss the sign, or... You just say, listen, I didn't see a sign, so I'm doing 25 miles an hour. Okay, so figure out what the default is, and you go to the default. Uh, Tim, uh, you either are or you aren't. Go above the speed limit, and there is no legal excuse other than the defense of necessity. Very difficult to use. <laughs> yeah, I, I know black letter law. That's what black letter law says, Tim, but the interesting part is, is that we know that traffic flow is always 5 to 10 miles an hour above the posted speed limit. It's always 5 to 10 kilometers an hour above the posted speed limit. I mean, for example, here in Vernon to Kelowna, there's a, it's, 90, it's posted 90 kilometers an hour, but everybody on that stretch of road is doing 110 kilometers an hour in a 90 zone. So what, you know, how does, how does, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, black letter law, but it's also policing and culture. So how do those two things kind of play into it? Because, yeah, you're going above the speed limit. We're, we're all going above the speed limit. But what is... Let me, let me think about that for a minute because I'm trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm asking, okay? Cyril, uh, how can I improve my learning disability because I had a hard time reading before? Okay, so Cyril, uh, we have a whole kind of uh, PowerPoint presentation with multiple choice questions on it. And Corey, I'll put those up for you. Those will help you as well. Okay, uh, Rocky, uh, I think I'm talking about how to exit a highway. I think that's what I'm asking you about. Okay, so Rocky, when you're getting off a highway or a freeway or an interstate, there's going to be a deceleration lane, so you get into the deceleration lane. So don't reduce your speed on the highway or freeway until you get into that deceleration lane. And then once you get into that deceleration lane, then you can start slowing down. Okay? The lemming defense is not usually successful. All right. <laughs> All right. Goose, OPP told me they don't usually pull anybody over unless they're going 25 to 30 uh, kilometers above the posted speed limit. Okay. All right, Tim, have a great dinner, and we'll talk to you next week, my friend. All the best. LW, how much above the posted speed limit can you drive without getting a speeding ticket? Uh, LW, we can't really tell you that because that's like asking us how long a piece of string is. And, uh, you know, usually you just got to keep up with traffic flow. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Rogelio, uh, thank you, sir. If it wasn't for my thirst for my license and for your abundance of info on driving correctly, I would have been still taking public transit. That's awesome. So happy to hear that we can help you out and get you a driver's license so that you're driving. 
really, really great. Uh, Coop Dog, what do you want me to do when I'm in the car with the driving instructor? Uh, do what the driving instructor tells you to do. Uh, you know, follow the instructions because that's what the driving instructor is there to do is to help you learn how to drive and prepare and pass your driver's test. So follow, you know, what they're telling you. Zahid, uh, I want to take a turn. I take a long turn. How do I keep on it on a shorter turn? Uh, I'm not following what you're asking me, Zahid. Are you asking me on how to control the vehicle when you go around a corner or those types of things? Uh, Con, here in Ontario, if there's no posted limit and not on a highway, it's 50 kilometers an hour. That's what I followed on my test and I passed. Yes, most of Canada, unless otherwise posted, is 50 kilometers an hour. <coughs> Excuse me. 50 kilometers an hour inside residential or inside urban areas, so in cities, and it's 80 kilometers an hour on highways, unless otherwise posted. Most of the U.S. in residential areas is 25 miles an hour, okay, and it's 80 or 50 miles an hour on highways and whatnot in the U.S. But again, each state is slightly different, so definitely have a look at that uh, when you're. Uh, you know, go over to the Smart Drive Test website, click on the frequently asked questions up at the top there, and check that and make sure that you got it right, okay? Okay, so Zahid, what I would suggest is if you're having difficulty with your turns, is to do some of the slow speed maneuvers, go to a parking lot, and work on reversing your vehicle, backing into parking spaces, and, you know, uh, backing up in a straight line, doing your parallel parking, that will help you with your turns because those slow speed maneuvers will improve your overall driving. And the other piece with your turns is, is if you want to make your turn shorter so you're not going out wide on your turns, is you need to look where you want the vehicle to go. Because oftentimes what happens is students go around the corner and they're, they're looking in the wrong direction. You want to be, so if you're making a right hand turn, for example, you want to be looking in that direction, not over there. And if you're looking over there, that's going to cause your vehicle to turn wide and you're going to go out in that direction. So look where you want the vehicle to go. The other piece with that is make sure that you're slowing the vehicle down. Students get into trouble because they're going too fast around the corner and the slower the vehicle goes, the sharper it turns. The faster you go, the less it's going to turn. So you got to get your speed down before you start turning the steering wheel to be able to control the vehicle through the turn. Cyril, I remember one time when I was in high school, I started driver ed and I did class there and then I took the, the driving lessons. Awesome. Daniel, how do I tell 100 feet when turning on your signals? Uh, Daniel, forget about the 100 feet thing. I know that's what they do in many of the states in the U.S. It's approximately half a block from where you're going to turn. So you go past the street, you get up halfway to the, the street that you're going to turn at, activate your signal. Uh, Goose, some new drivers don't realize they have side windows. <laughs> I think that's only because they're so terrified of the actual driving experience and realizing it's a lot more challenging than what they expected initially, Goose, is that they're they're going to have a lot, you know, that they, they just don't turn their head to look at the side windows when they're driving. Uh, Rocky, thank you for the answers and off to bed. Now ready for the last day of homeschool. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, have a great last day there, Rocky, and enjoy your summer holidays, and we will see you next week. Jello, uh, what should I do when I'm going to the hospital like an emergency and I want everybody to know about it? Uh, Jello, even emergency doesn't allow you to go above the posted speed limit, but you need to activate your four-way flashers and you need to drive in an expedient manner going to the hospital during an emergency. But again, you cannot, you know, if it's, if it's that bad, if it's that much of an emergency, then you should be calling an ambulance, not taking that upon yourself. Chosen one, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome, my friend. How are you doing? Uh, Goose, all they see is the front of the hood. <laughs> yes, been there, Goose. Seen, done that. Uh, Captain, how far do we stop behind a car when stopping at a red light? Uh, Captain, when you stop in a line of traffic, you should be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front 
making clear contact with the roadway. That's where you stop. And uh, Corey will put up the video for you on space management and that will help you out uh, with that question. Jim Bob, tow trucks are emergency vehicles. Uh, Jim Bob, no, tow trucks are not classified as one of the emergency vehicles. So emergency vehicles, ambulance, police, fire vehicles, uh, search and rescue, uh, that's basically it. Uh, in the province of Ontario and some other places, volunteer firefighters have uh, green flashing lights when they respond to an emergency, but that's the only place that I know that has uh, that for emergency volunteer firefighters. There might be some other provinces, but I haven't heard of anything. And if anybody knows that or any smart drivers watching now or watching on the replay, uh, let me know. Okay. And if you're watching here, watching now, watching on the replay, definitely head over to the Smart Drive Test website and check out the Smarter Driver course package guaranteed to pass your driver's test. As well, we throw in the Winter and Defensive Driving Smart courses. Those will uh, guarantee that you drive smarter, drive safer, reduce significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash after you get your license. So that's over there, $37.97 USD, and check that out. Uh, Sarah, I'm looking to buy a secondhand car from a car dealership. What are your top tips? Uh, Sarah, there's a playlist on how to buy a car, how to buy a secondhand car. The one th couple of things that I would mention, Sarah, is if you're going to buy a vehicle from a dealership, uh, <clears throat> secondhand, depending on what you're looking at, you know, obviously look at the car facts, make sure that there aren't, you know, any crashes on the vehicle or those types of things. If there are crashes on the vehicle, you need to figure out whether you can live with those or not. Uh, you know, whether they're major crashes or those types of things. Uh, keep an eye out, watch if the vehicle is a rebuild. Uh, and if you can buy the vehicle outright, that's going to be better for you. It's going to be cheaper for insurance because if, as soon as you put financing on the vehicle, you have to have collision. And as soon as you put collision on your vehicle, your insurance is now twice as much. So you, those are kind of all things that you need to figure out uh, when you're buying a secondhand vehicle. But definitely, Corey will put up the playlist for you on buying a vehicle. And there's some information there that will help you out. Uh, Crystal, excellent uh, practice driving with my dad in an empty parking lot. My dad said I did really well for my first lesson. That's awesome, Crystal. Congratulations. And that's excellent that that's where you're starting out. <clears throat> Chosen one, today I was with an instructor and I made a mistake. Uh, <clears throat> we're not supposed to switch lanes in an intersection. I did it about three times. It's great that I made the mistake to know about it. Yes, and even for people who are not preparing for a driver's test, don't change lanes in an intersection. There's too much going on in an intersection. And as we said previously, 40%, more than 40% of crashes happen at intersections. So changing lanes just adds another layer to the complexity of things that are going on there and you want to reduce your chances of being involved in a crash so don't change lanes in an intersection uh crystal you're most welcome if we can help you out further drop us a note well, always always happy to help out mallory when i got my new hearing aids in december one of the first sounds i heard was the windshield wipers as it was raining that day <laughs> yes nothing like windshield wipers sometimes i just like a long drive in rain with the windshield wipers on. There's something meditative about the whole experience. Uh, <laughs> Goose, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, I can hear all of the driving instructors in North America bristling when somebody says, oh, I changed lanes in the intersection. <laughs> yeah, DC, any tips on how to merge safely on the highway from the acceleration lane? Yes, uh, DC. So when you're coming out on the on-ramp and on some, it's going to depend on where you are because some acceleration lanes are going to be short, some are going to be longer. You may have to use part of the on-ramp as your acceleration lane. But as you're coming out on the on-ramp, look out on the highway and pick your spot and aim for that spot. You know, most pieces of information about merging onto a highway or an interstate or a freeway they're all going to say, oh, you know, match the speed of the traffic on the highway. Well, it's easier if you have a place to aim for. If you can aim for that place, you're, you're, you're automatically going to start getting the vehicle up to speed, matching the speed on the highway or freeway, and you're going to pick that spot. And if there's a big truck out there, if there's a transport truck, most of the time you want to merge in behind that transport truck. All right. And if you're the least bit unsure of how to merge onto a highway or you're not comfortable with it, 
take somebody with you, take a mentor with you, somebody that you trust who can give you a bit, a bit of feedback so you don't get kind of out there and, and freeze up and get stuck. But I would also suggest that you practice when there isn't a lot of traffic. So earlier in the morning or later in the evening, that way you can practice it without a lot of vehicles and traffic out there. And as well, make sure that you have your signal on, okay? Because you need to ask other traffic to move over. Uh, they're not necessarily going to. Keep in mind, the onus of responsibility for merging is on the merging vehicle. So know that. But pick your spot, aim for your spot, and get your foot into it. And just know that, you know, you got to get that vehicle up to speed uh, when you're merging. Uh, John, what is meant by a yield sign? yellow and a red one okay so a yellow one is generally going to be a cautionary sign a red one is actually a regulatory sign and you must give way to other road users at that intersection uh, or wherever you find a, a, a yield sign and on highways and freeways and interstates if you come on the on-ramp and there's a yield sign there that's simply reminding you as the merging driver that you the onus of responsibility for you getting out onto the highway safely is on you it's not on the traffic on the highway the highway the traffic on the highway doesn't have to move over uh, and sometimes they can't move over because of the way the traffic is out there so you need to get your foot into it and you need to pick your spot and aim for that spot uh, without hesitation uh, Crystal, no, you are very helpful to me, and so are your videos. I watch Monday and Thursday, and that is awesome, Crystal. So happy we can help you out. Fam, uh, if the steering wheel is on the right side of the car, can I drive in countries where they drive on the right side of the, uh, of the road? Uh, fam, yes, you can go to other places in the world. You can get yourself an international driver's license. And so, for example, you can, you can, you can go to other countries that drive on the other side of the road. Yeah, you can do that for sure. Uh, Mallory, what is the meaning of a yellow light? The meaning of a yellow light is that the light's about to change red and you must come to a stop. For the purposes of a driver's test, yellow and red traffic lights mean exactly the same thing, that you must bring the vehicle to a stop. On a driver's test, if, you're in, if you proceed through the intersection on a yellow light and the examiner looks up through the top of the windshield and sees that light turn red, that's an automatic fail on a driver's test. So know that, that you need to bring the vehicle to a stop. But before you bring the vehicle to a stop, make sure that you check <laughs> the center mirror and make sure that there isn't somebody who's going to park in your trunk when you start uh, locking it up. Because in some instances on a driver's test, you're going to have to be aggressive on the brakes to get the vehicle stopped. Okay, know that. Olivia, I passed my driver's license. Thank you so much. Olivia, you are most welcome. So happy that we can help out. And uh, that is really great. And what are you, what'd you do to go and celebrate, Olivia? Crystal, no. Okay, got that. Crystal, also my birthday is coming up on the 11th of July. That is awesome. And happy pre-birthday, uh, Crystal. That's really great. And you're getting your license. <laughs> All awesome. Jim Bob, how do you yield to an emergency vehicle when stopped at a red light? Uh, Jim Bob, usually your best course of action when you're stopped at a red light at an intersection is to simply stay where you are. Don't go anywhere. Don't move. If you're at the front of the queue, you might want to turn right and go around the corner. But for the most part, just stay where you are. Because most of the time what's happened is, is that you're stopped. The traffic on the other side of the intersection is stopped. The ambulance or fire emergency vehicle will just come up. They'll go into the other lane and then they'll come back around and they'll continue on. So that's how they'll get past you. Uh, James, in Vancouver, the posted speed limit on four main roads is 50 kilometers an hour. Do you recommend a speed range of 48 to 53 when doing the class seven? Uh, James, you want to try and do as close to 50 kilometers an hour as you can for the purposes of the driver's test. And again, I come back to this, uh, this information that your speed limit, your, your speed management is tied into your observation. So every eight to 10 seconds, you're looking down the road, looking at your instrument panel, in looking at your beers. So every eight to 10 seconds, you should be adjusting your speed as you're driving. If you're not adjusting your speed kind of every 10 seconds, the examiner knows that you're not observing properly because you're not looking far down the road, you're not checking your instrument panel, and that's what you need to be doing to be successful on passing your driver's test. 
Goose, merging on the 401 is quite an exhilarating experience. Floor it to 12130, merge, then change lanes. Crazy. Uh, so glad I live up in the north. Is Sudbury really the north of Ontario? Sudbury's not... It, yeah, it is north of North Bay. Yeah, North Bay is kind of the line. It, it's different. <laughs> different up there. Uh, Carly, my test is tomorrow. My birthday is on Thursday. I'm so nervous. Uh, Carly, are you nervous for your birthday? Because that's, that's kind of inevitable. Epic videos are so helpful from instructors like you and others around the world. Uh, diamond signs have varying messages. One of these has a bicycle sign combined with a square sign that says trail exiting. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That's exactly it, Epic, is, is that the cautionary signs, the diamond signs with the yellow background and black lettering on them, those things can have any information on them. You know, they are just... <laughs> the one traffic sign that can mean just about anything, which is really crazy. Commander, um, Leo, not too long ago, I didn't pass my California driver's test. Reason behind the failure was a critical error on a lane violation uh, to right of the bicycle lane. Okay, so Commander, there's a couple, there's two videos here on bicycle lanes, and this isn't just for Commander. This is for everybody who's turning right with a bicycle lane. <clears throat> It's that you have to pay attention to the road markings. And in some states, the road markings are going to go to dashed at the intersection. And that means that you can move into the bicycle lane. But again, you got to shoulder check and make sure that there isn't a cyclist there. Uh, here in Canada and other places, Seattle and whatnot, when you come to the intersection, it's a solid line at the bicycle lane. And you cannot move into it. You must stay out of the bicycle lane at the intersection. But again, do, turning right, turning left... Anytime you move the vehicle sideways, you got a shoulder check, 90 degree shoulder check, and that's going to keep you safe. The other piece with this, MIT, not the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the state of Massachusetts in the states, but mapping intersections and trapping, tracking road users. As you're approaching the intersection, so you're coming up half a block away from the intersection, there's a cyclist. You get to the intersection and you go to turn right. Well, you didn't map the inter you didn't take note and map that cyclist back there because you knew they were there. You saw them as you were approaching the intersection. So after you map them and you say, "Hey, there's a cyclist there," you should be tracking that cyclist as you're approaching the intersection. That's what you need to do: map, figure out where the road users are. Are they going to cross your path of travel as you get to the intersection and you're conducting your maneuvers? And then you're tracking them. Where'd they go? Where'd that, where'd that cyclist go? Okay, so that's what you need to be doing to be safe at the intersection. <clears throat> uh, Jim Bob, there are three codes when I'm responding to an emergency. Okay, I don't know about that. Goose, Sudbury is the tropical hub of northern Ontario. Tropical. Ooh, not, Sudbury and tropical? Those two words go together? I don't think they go together. I think like parka and Sudbury go together. Those are like two words that go together. Not tropical and Sudbury. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, Crystal, I live in Southern California. Awesome. Chosen one. Difficult part on turning right at an intersection is still expecting if cars are incoming when you don't see any coming from behind another car. Uh, seen a motorcycle come when turning right. Any tips? Shoulder check, shoulder check, shoulder check. Signal, signal, signal. Okay. Make sure you're doing that when you're executing your turns. That will help you to track other road users as you're at an intersection. Uh, fam, why does not Canada drive in the right side of the road like other Commonwealth countries? Uh, fam, we do drive on the right here in Canada. Uh, do you mean not drive on the left? Yeah, because we're influenced by the United States. That's why we drive on the right. Uh, Jim Bob, when I'm approaching a railway bridge, there was a police car with its emergency lights on a truck and I passed, the roof was ripped. Okay, yep, that's why they'd be responding. Uh, nice, map and track, yes. Justin, hey coach, a quick question. If there is incoming vehicles while doing the three-point turn, should I stop in the middle of the road and let them pass? Uh, Justin, if you're against the curb, then yes, but otherwise, most of the time, they're gonna wait for you. And the other thing about doing a three-point turn for the purposes of your driver's test, they're going to do it in a place where there isn't much traffic. Usually they're going to do it at the uh, a dead end road. Um, 
they're going to do it at the end of like a dead end road or their place there isn't much traffic so you're probably that's probably not going to be something you're going to have to worry about for the purposes of your three-point turn uh my friend tim uh code one get there when you can okay so that's not an important one uh james how do you know when to not turn right into a bus lane when you are turning right in at, at an intersection Okay, so there's going to be reserved lane signs, uh, James, that are going to tell you that you cannot go into that lane, or it's going to be a high occupancy vehicle lane, or the road markings will tell you that, okay? Okay, so Tim, code two, get there without delay, and then code three, lights and sirens, emergency response, uh, getting there as quickly as you can. So yes, there are three different ones, uh, codes of responses. Awesome, thanks for that information, Tim. Sarah, having only an electric fan in the lower mainland in the middle of the heat wave is fun. <laughs> yes, it is fun right now on the west coast of North America. It is very toasty. Very, very toasty. Uh, John, is it a good thing to do hazard lights when we are backing or reversing? Uh, John, if you're backing up more than a couple of car lengths, then yes, I would suggest that you put your hazard lights on. Uh, unfortunately, some driving examiners frown upon that for whatever reason, but I do suggest that for those of you in the state of Oregon and those of you in the state of California that are backing up along a curb for 50 feet, it's an unpredictable action, and I do encourage you to put your hazard lights on to keep yourself safe. All right, so if you're watching now, uh, watching on the replay, you know all the stuff to do on YouTube that people tell you to do 100,000 times. Hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, leave a comment down below. But I'm going to tell you as well, if you're preparing for a driver's test, head over to the Smart Drive Test website and check out the Smarter Driver course package, guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. And as a bonus, we'll throw in both the winter and defensive driving smart courses. Those will significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash after you get your license. Now, it's busy right now because we're opening up after COVID. Driving lessons are hard to get because driving schools are busy, slammed, and DMVs don't have a lot of appointments and those types of things. We know as driving instructors that if you don't take some form of driver education, your chances of passing are less than 50%, but with driver education, that raises to over 90. So this is a good option for you to be able to get some driver education and pass your driver's test first time. So check that out as well. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm not even going to go there. Goose, to me, anything above five, minus five degrees is tropical. Oh, Goose, you would fit, you would feel right at home in winter peg. You could go and hang out with Corey. <laughs> Excellent. Crystal, I even graduated from high school this year and it was in person. And Crystal, that is absolutely awesome. You've had just an absolutely terrific year. Your birthday coming up, you're practicing for your license, and you graduated high school. Absolutely awesome. Chosen one, I'm six foot four, quite a heavy individual. Any tips to getting used to applying weight on the gas pedal? I feel like my foot is heavy. Uh, yes, put the heel of your foot on the floor of the car and then use the ball of your foot to press the, the fuel pedal. And as well, put the ball of your foot down near the bottom of the, the gas pedal and just play around with that a little bit and kind of move it up and down and see what works better for you. All of that will kind of help you out with controlling the fuel pedal. And as Goose said, imagine an egg under your foot. That'll help too. Uh, Mallory, thank you. Great live stream tonight. And these are all great tips. Your channel is one of my favorite here on YouTube. And that is awesome. Thank you, Mallory, for being part of the Smart Driver community. Uh, if you've ha passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations on that. And if you have a test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And we will see you next Monday because we have maybe Canada Day, which, you know, is going to be postponed indefinitely. And then, of course, there will definitely be Independence Day on the 4th of July in the United States. So we'll see you next Monday. All the best. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.